Uh, my name is Colton Knight. Uh, we will also be joined today by Miss Ashley Wright. Uh, she is a livestock agent in Arizona, uh, and, and she helped me create this PowerPoint and presentation. And so we will have both our contact info at the end of the presentation if you need to email either of us any questions you may have on, on keeping chickens. Uh, today, it's, it's getting started with chickens, and this is basically a large overview of, uh, of just about everything you need to know with, with chickens. We, we won't get into the weeds too much with some of this stuff, uh, but we're going to cover a very broad topic today. Uh, the, the first thing you have to ask yourself, and, and we just asked this on the poll, so I, I kind of have a good feel of the room is why do you want chickens? Uh, chickens are good for eggs. They're good for meat. Uh, they make good pets. You know, it's, it's a good thing to have chickens around to teach your children about responsibility and farming. Uh, and folks even show chickens. Uh, those groups are usually called chicken fanciers uh, and, and they can have some very remarkable looking chickens in, in those shows. And there's several pros and cons to raising your own chickens. Uh, Let's start over here on the pro column. Uh, first, they're easy to find, but more importantly, they're easier to get rid of. So let's say that, that you've never kept livestock before and you decide, I wanna start small, let's get some chickens, or you happen to be randomly walking through the feed store and you couldn't resist purchasing a half a dozen of the cute little fuzzy chicks, but then once you start taking care of them on a day-to-day -day basis, you realize, hey, uh, I'm allergic to chickens or I don't have time for chickens. Uh, you can always just advertise them on Facebook or give them to your friends. Uh, you know, sometimes if you have goats or sheep or cows or something, you can purchase those relatively easy, uh, but getting rid of them can be difficult at times. So chickens are really easy to both get and get rid of. Uh, they don't cost a whole lot of money you know, you're, you're looking at a couple dollars per chicken if you buy them as chicks. Uh, you know, if you're raising them for meat, they have a very short production cycle. So you can buy a chick and then six weeks later, uh, you can have a broiler ready to eat. They are very efficient animals when it comes to their feed conversion ratio. And that, that means how much feed it takes for them to gain one pound of bird. So most chickens, are about a two to one ratio. So it takes about two pounds of feed for that bird to gain one pound. Uh, if you compare that to pigs, they're about three to one. And then when you get into like cattle and sheep and things, they're, they're anywhere from six to eight pounds of feed to one pound of gain. So you can see why we say that they are very efficient animals. Uh, they can assist with insect control uh, I'm going to go into that a little bit more later. Uh, they're excellent to have around for fresh eggs and meat. And they, they work as devices to improve your soil. So if you have them out on your grass, they're going to poop on the grass and that adds uh, nutrients to the soil. Or if you've got them in a coop and you, you keep the litter and compost it, then you can use that to spread out on your, your soil or your garden. And most importantly, it's fun to have chickens. Everybody likes keeping chickens. Uh, you find that they become your pets, you name them, uh, you find the ones with the most personality and start to bond with them. So uh, chickens are fun to keep around. Now, some of the things that you also have to keep in mind, as with any animals, uh, they have to be fed, watered, and cared for every single day. You know, it doesn't matter if you are sick, it doesn't matter if it's raining outside. It doesn't matter if you're on vacation. It doesn't matter if it's a holiday. Uh, the animals don't know that. They have to be taken care of every single day. So if you can't make that kind of commitment to the animals, uh, then you should not get the animals. Uh, second, you're gonna need some infrastructure. They're gonna need a place to live. Uh, we're gonna go over that in detail in the second half of this presentation. Uh, whenever you keep animals around, especially animal feed around, you are going to attract rodents. And so we're going to talk about how we prevent that 
later on in this presentation. You should expect that when you keep animals, they die. You know, and sometimes you don't know why. Uh, sometimes you do know why. Sometimes it's heartbreaking. Sometimes it could have been preventable and you feel terrible. Uh, but just keep in mind, that's just part of keeping animals is the circle of life and, and they do die. Here in Maine, we have uh, some added difficulty in the winter because of the, the frigid temperatures. So we, we have a specific section in this PowerPoint presentation and talk where we're going to talk about keeping uh, chickens over winter. Uh, there are some disease concerns with chickens and we're going to talk about a few of those. Uh, noise. And when I say noise, more specifically, uh, usually the, the most annoying thing is a rooster crowing. And if you live in town and have neighbors, it may be a better decision that you don't get roosters. Uh, because they do crow. They crow very early in the morning. It is very loud. If your neighbors do not like chickens or they're working the night shift and they just get home to go to sleep and the chickens waking them up constantly, uh, you, you can make your neighbors mad with excessive noise. So it's always good to keep that in mind uh, is to be courteous to those around you. Uh, if you don't mind noise, uh, then keep as many as you'd like. You know, another thing that makes a lot of noise is guinea fowl and peacocks. So those animals are better kept if you live out in the country and not in town or the suburbs. And when it comes to economics, it is cheaper to go to the grocery store and buy your own eggs than it is to feed and house chickens throughout the year and produce your own eggs. That's just an economy of scale thing. Uh, commercial egg producers have tens of thousands, if not millions of chickens, so they can get the cost down very low. But there's a certain satisfaction of raising your own food, knowing where your food comes from, and most of the time that outweighs the, the cost of the eggs. Now, we, we talked about this a little earlier. Uh, you can purchase meat production chickens. There are breeds that are characteristically better for meat production, they, they grow larger muscle and they grow quicker. You can buy breeds of chickens that are specifically for egg production. They do not have good meat characteristics. And then there are birds that are categorized as dual purpose birds. And what that means is they're not as good as at either, generally don't work out as well. Now, a big thing that you'll hear people talk about is, oh, I've got ticks. I'm going to go get chickens. They're going to eat all my ticks. Chickens do eat bugs. That's a fact. Uh, you can see them do it. There have been a few studies done in the United States, and chickens really are not an effective control of the tick population. They do contribute to tick control, uh, but chickens by themselves will not eliminate ticks in your yard. Uh, some folks will keep fancy chickens for feathers. You know, here in Maine, uh, fly fishing is a pretty strong sport. So folks like to tie their own flies. Uh, and certain feathers are valuable to folks that do tie flying and other things. Uh, like I said earlier, people show chickens and people just keep chickens around as pets or, or for their kids or, or what have. Uh, we talked about the time allocation for chickens. Uh, the other thing is, do you have space for chickens? Chickens don't need a lot of space, so that's generally not a limiting factor. Uh, but a strong limiting factor, however, is does your town allow chickens? And every town has different ordinances on how many chickens you can keep, whether or not you can even keep chickens, or whether chickens are, are a free-for-all. You know, I live out in the country. Uh, I don't have any regulations. Uh, but if you live in town, you should probably check with the town council uh, to see if they are allowed and if there are any regulations on those. This page that we're going to be talking about is how long does it take for your chickens to grow up and be effective chickens? So when you buy them as chicks and raise them, you know, they're cute and floppy, but when am I going to get eggs or when can we eat them? So if we buy a broiler breed of chickens, like a Cornish Cross or a Red or Black Freedom Ranger, we can expect those birds to be ready to eat in approximately six to eight weeks. Now, if you want really, really big chickens, 
They're like eating turkey. Uh, if you keep them beyond that, they can even get up to seven or 12 pounds. Uh, some birds like a Cornish cross yes. were really not developed to live that long and they can actually outgrow their legs and, and their hearts might give out. So, so keep that in mind. And laying hens are gonna start laying when they're approximately 20 weeks old. Some a little sooner, some a little later. And once they do start laying, uh, they actually have a specific number of, of oocytes in their reproductive tract. And so they're gonna be able to lay approximately four to 500 eggs. That's usually about how many eggs you can get out of chicken. And I said earlier, you know, you can buy eggs cheaper than you can raise your own. So let's look at this chart. It takes approximately four pounds of feed to produce 12 eggs. And if the cost of grain is $15 a bag, the average cost of feed for producing your own eggs is $1.20. And that doesn't include the cost of the chicken, the cost of bedding, the cost of the infrastructure and all that stuff. So you can go to the store right now and buy eggs cheaper than that in most places. And if you were raising an organic flock, it more than doubles the price to the cost of eggs. Now, organic eggs at the grocery store uh, are generally fairly expensive. So you may be able to make the organic eggs work out cheaper than, than you can go buy them at the store. Uh, for those of you that were interested in, in raising meat birds, uh, the king of meat birds is what we call the Cornish cross. And that's a cross between a commercial white Cornish chicken and a white Plymouth Rock chicken. And what happens is, is we've developed these breeds over the last five, six generations to be excellent meat producing birds. So when you go to the grocery store or your favorite restaurant, the chicken meat that you are buying is a Cornish cross chicken, okay? They have fantastic feed conversion. Uh, when raised in a commercial setting, they are less than two pounds to one pound of gain. They have very large breast muscles and very large leg muscles. So you get a very meaty chicken. However, they don't live very long. And, and that's very important because they grow so quickly, uh, they can actually outgrow their legs and outgrow their heart's capacity to keep them moving around a lot. So we don't like to keep these past eight weeks old. Now, in a response, to the commercial industry producing these birds to just grow so quickly. There are a few slow growing breeds. Uh, and the most common of those slow growing breeds is the Freedom Ranger. And they take about two to three weeks longer to reach the same weight as a Cornish cross, but they don't suffer from the, the leg and breast abrasion issues that you might see in those Cornish rock cross birds. And then of course, there's some really fancy breeds of chickens. Uh, that you'll see on uh, cooking shows or magazine articles. Uh, the first is a breast chicken. Uh, this is a, a French chicken that's uh, supposed to be one of the best tasting chickens that you can eat. Uh, and when their meat is fully cooked, it's still pink. So a lot of times folks will, will go to a restaurant or something and they order this expensive breast chicken and the, the meat comes out and they say, hey, my chicken isn't cooked. And then the, the chef has to explain, no, the chicken is cooked, but the meat is pink and not white like you're used to seeing. And, and then a complete polar opposite from that is a Yam Si Mami chicken. And they are completely black. Their feathers are black, their skin is black, their beak is black, their meat is like a dark purplish color and their organs are a dark purplish color. So the thing is just black from head to toe inside and out. Those are, those are really unique looking chickens. I've never had the opportunity to try one of those uh, because they are very expensive. And then a lot of folks will ask me, you know, well, what about our laying hens? You know, if we get tired of our laying hens or they're getting old, can we just eat those? Uh, and so once chickens get older than about, I don't know, 12 or 14 weeks old, uh, the meat becomes very tough. The cartilage gets thick and, and chewy. But laying hens simply do not have a lot of meat on their skeleton. So if you look at the carcass to the right, that is a Cornish rock bird. You can see just how huge that breast is, how big the thighs are, how big the drumsticks are. 
And then on the left would be a typical laying hen. And you can see it's pretty skinny looking. So not a lot of meat on those. And you know, in the past, those kind of chickens were, were usually boiled or something to make chicken and dumplings or something along that lines to really soften that meat up and be able to separate it from the bones easily. This is not a chicken that you would want to fry up for some good fried chicken or, or roast it on the grill. And then there's lots of ornamental breeds and these are chickens we just keep around because they look pretty. Uh, or we like their, their personalities. Uh, if up here on the top left, that's that I am Samani chicken that's, that's just black. You can see his eyes are black, his waddles are black, his combs are feathered, everything. Beautiful, unique looking chickens. Uh, there's some Polish chickens on here that, that have big, huge pom poms on top of their heads. Some chickens with really pretty feathers. Uh, down here in the bottom center, these are called Japanese silk chickens. They have feathers, but their feathers resemble hair and they're very soft so that's why they get called silk chickens uh, these are smaller chickens they lay smaller eggs but they're super friendly uh, if you just want chickens for pets and the occasional egg these are these are good choices for that now we've kind of gone over just the basic overall part about chickens and, and raising some meat chickens there let's start where most people do you know they, they've gone to the feed store or they've gotten a catalog in the mail and they have ordered in some live chicks or bought some live chicks so that are only a couple days old. Uh, and when we put chicks in an environment and raise them like this, it's called a brooder. And the process of doing this is called brooding. The, the most important part when it comes to brooding chicks is you want to set up the brooder a couple days before the chicks arrive. Uh, and this allows the brooder to reach proper temperature and you can monitor it for a day or two to make sure that it maintains proper temperature. And also if there's any problems associated with the, the brooder, you'll be able to fix it before the chicks get there. Brooders don't have to be expensive. Uh, they just need to be a clean, dry, well-ventilated environment that doesn't have uh, any drafts. They need to be safe and secure and that is safe for both chickens and people chickens can carry salmonella so it's a better idea to, to brood them out in the garage or the barn or in the basement or something you do not want to brood chicks on your kitchen countertop or the dining room table because that can spread around salmonella and it's a very common things for folks to do and, and speaking of salmonella uh, you don't want to pick up the chicks and rub them on your face or kiss the chickens uh, because that can lead a nasty, nasty salmonella infection on your face. Uh, I have seen folks with huge open sores on their face from, from rubbing up on chickens like that. So that's never a good idea. And the folks that are most susceptible to that, kind of like COVID-19, are older population, and of course, the younger kids are the most susceptible to that. Uh, the other thing we have to keep in mind is that the heat source is very safe and secure. Uh, we're gonna talk quite a bit about safe heating sources, so I'm not gonna get into it too much right now. Uh, the first week you have the chicks, they need 24 hour light. That's so that they can get up and find water and get up and find food all throughout the day and the night. Now, after a week old, if you have a different type of heating source, you don't have to leave the light on. And here's some examples of different types of chicken brooders. Uh, I picked these particular examples because they were all safely constructed and I didn't pick out ones that, that were just terrible. And, and like I said, they don't have to be anything fancy. You commonly see people brooding chicks in aquariums, kitty swimming pools, plastic totes you buy at the store, cardboard, uh, water troughs, or, or they make them out of plywood. Uh, one thing that you'll see that's very common in all four of these brooders uh, is the, the heat lamp that they're using for a heat source is being hung from up above and they are not utilizing that clamp that comes with a heat lamp. I have never seen a heat lamp that comes with a decent clamp. They're all garbage. They all fail eventually, uh, and they're very dangerous. They can actually, if, they, if that clamp fails, it can fall down on the wood shavings and set fire to the whole place. Fire damage from heat lamps is a real thing, and countless homes are burned down every year because of careless use of heat lamps. 
animals. Now, as a backyard producer or a home producer, we have three basic options for keeping our chicks warm. When the chicks arrive, that brooder needs to be 95 degrees Fahrenheit. The first week it's 95, the second week it's gonna be 90, the third week it's gonna be 85. So we drop the temperature five degrees each week until those chicks develop full feathers. And then once they have a full set of feathers, they can keep themselves warm and we can turn the heating source off and we can move them out to the coop or what have you. Now, if it's real cold when you move them out to the coop, it's probably a better idea to, to, to give them some supplemental heat because they can dog pile on top of each other and crush the chicks on the bottom if they get real cold. But the three main sources we have for heat is a heating pad, and that goes on the ground and the, the chicks stand on top of it. Uh, these actually work really well. I like these. Uh, the problem is, is they're usually pretty small and most of the time they do not have adjustable temperatures. They have limited use. The most common thing you use are heat lamps. And there's a picture of just a regular old heat lamp. The thing that I like to use the most are these heating tables or radiant heating mechanisms here. You see the heating element sits on a, it's like a table and you can adjust the height of the table. So you, you adjust the height of the table to be back level height of the chick and then you raise it up as the chick gets older. Uh, the cool thing about these heating tables is they use a lot less electricity than the heat lamp. Uh, I believe the one I have pictured here only uses 40 watts of electricity, whereas the heat lamp will use anything from 125 to 250 watts of electricity. They don't pose a strong fire damage like heat lamps can. They're easy to clean and the chicks take a lot of comfort from being able to, to huddle up underneath of it. This particular heating table will hold between 15 and 25 chicks. So if you have a large batch of chicks, uh, one heating table is not going to be enough. You're going to need two or three of those if you have a large batch of chicks. And so they're the most expensive of all the heating options to buy, but they're also the cheapest to run long term. So I know at my house, if I run a heat lamp, for a month with a 250 watt bulb, that adds about $50 onto the electricity bill. So the cost of the table is eliminated through the cost of the electricity. That There are actually so many fires due to heat lamps that the uh, American Poultry Association and poultry vets actually put out publications to warn people of the dangers of heat lamps. And, and the reason that they're dangerous is those heat lamp bulbs, especially if you buy the 250 watt bulbs, uh, they can get up upwards of 500 degrees. And whenever dust settles on that, it could, that dust could ignite. The clamp will fail and it'll lean down on the, onto the sawdust and, or, or the, the wood box or the cardboard or what have you, and it just ignites. It's a sad thing to see when people lose homes to heat lamps or lose barns to heat lamps and lose chickens to uh, poorly secure heat lamps. If you're going to use a heat lamp, there is a safe way to use a heat lamp. Now, the most expensive heat lamps have the most protection. So if we look up here in the upper right hand corner, you can see this Premier One heat lamp. It's got a plastic shroud around it that insulates it from touching things and, and, and setting fire. And it's got a really sturdy guard on the bottom. The cord has a metal spring and that keeps it from getting kinked up or, or wearing through the insulation and having exposed wires. Uh, these work really great when I like to use these whenever I can. But if you can't find one of those or, or you already have a regular heat lamp, uh, that's fine. Just be sure to hang the heat lamp. You know, so this picture is showing that the heat lamp is being hung from up above. You'll see that heat lamps have a, a little wire tab for hanging them. And I just go ahead and I unscrew the clamp and I throw it away uh, because those clamps always work themselves loose uh, and, and they always fail eventually. So I just don't use those at all. If you're going to use these less expensive style heat lamps, at least get one that has a guard on it. I think I went to Paris Farmers Union the other day and I bought one and it was $8 for a heat lamp with a guard on it, compared to $6 for one without a guard on it. And that'll just keep it, in case it does, something does happen and it falls down, it just keeps that bulb from directly contacting the surface. And if you're gonna use a heat lamp inside, there is absolutely no need 
to utilize that 250 watt bulb. A 100 watt or 125 watt bulb will keep those chickens nice and warm in the house in a climate controlled room without the fire damage issue. Uh, now, if you have a large brooder or you're raising them outside in the barn or something, the 250 watt bulb might be needed, uh, but just make sure that you're using it safely. Now, folks will sometimes ask, should you use a red bulb or a white bulb? Uh, the red bulbs are, are pretty handy if uh, you have injured chicks or if chicks or chickens are, are pecking each other. Uh, the red bulb will kind of mask blood, scabs, and sores, and then the, the chicks won't see it, and they won't pick at each other very much. So they, they have their, their purposes. When we talk about the brooder temperature, uh, the best thing to do is set up your brooder, put a thermometer inside the brooder at a couple different locations, and make sure the temperature is just right. But there's also some other things that we can look at to see if our brooder temperature is right and the birds are comfortable. So the first thing is, is how are they distributed throughout the brooder? If the brooder is the right temperature, the chicks will be evenly distributed throughout the brooder. So if this uh, orange dot represents the, uh, the shine of the heat lamp, you can see that the chicks are equally distributed outside and inside of that light walking around the, the brooder freely. Now in the second situation, the brooder is too cold and the chicks are huddled together tightly under directly underneath the heat source. And there's a couple reasons we don't want to see this. One, they're too cold, so that leads to stress and they could get sick. Uh, but secondly, uh, when they're too cold and they, they, they huddle up really closely together, you can get that dog pile effect and uh, they can actually crush one another. Now, similarly, if you see them all dog piled up into the corner, uh, that's probably because there's a draft in the room. So they, they're getting some, some cold air draft. And, and so they're gonna avoid that draft by getting up into the corner. And then the last thing is if it's just too hot underneath of that heat lamp, you'll see those around the light of the heat lamp avoiding it at all cost because they don't want to get roasted. Uh, this can be a severe problem because if it's too hot in there, you can kill them. So let's look at a few examples of what a brooder that is too hot looks like. So in this situation, this person has a pretty nice brooder set up. You know, he's got that heat lamp hanging. He's got a 125 watt bulb in there. He's got plenty of food and water for the chicks. But you can see those chicks are not going anywhere near the light. They are staying on the outside of the light. That's because that heat lamp is too low and it's too hot directly below that heat lamp. Now here's the opposite problem. These chicks are too cold. You can see they're, they're huddled up directly underneath of the heat lamp and you can see the shine of the heat lamp and they're all piled up here. Again, here they are again. They're, they're all huddled together super closely. Down here, you can see these chicks are all huddled together up real cold, and they're, they're trying to use their body heat to keep warm. And here's the chicks all in the corner, you know, trying to avoid that draft. And, and one characteristic that you can definitely tell, is it too cold or, or, or drafty? See how the chicks are all kind of facing one way? If you look at their eyeballs, they're all facing the corner, and they're putting their backs to the drafts. And, and so that's how they're trying to stay warm. When it's just right, you'll see, and these are ducklings, these aren't chicks. I, I apologize for that picture. I didn't have any chicks at the time I was taking these pictures for the PowerPoint. These are my ducklings I have at home. You can see these ducklings are both underneath the light and outside the light resting, and they're not piled together tightly. So you can see the space around the ducklings. That means that they're nice and comfy. Just to kind of review this again, because this is the number one problem I see with uh, chick brooders is, is folks not having their temperature set correctly. We can look at the distribution. Now there's a couple other things that we can do to make sure that those chicks are comfortable. And one is listen to them. If you go into the room and the chicks are peeping loudly, that means that they are distressed in some way. Now they normally peep all the time anyway, but it's kind of like a lower tone uh, not very loud. You couldn't hear them if you had the TV on. Uh, but if they're peeping louder than normal, 
they're stressed about something. And so the first thing you want to check is if they have water. Do they have food? Is the bedding clean and dry? And then the third is look at the distribution of the chicks inside the brooder to see if it's cold, hot, or drafty. And we have to allow room for growth in our brooders. You know, how big of a brooder do you need? Well, it depends. Uh, if you're raising meat chickens, uh, they grow much faster than a laying chicken. So if we look over here on the left, this is a barred rock laying hen. She's six weeks old. She's about the size of a small Nerf football. Whereas if we look over here on the right at this Cornish cross that's six weeks old, this bird is full grown and it's ready to be harvested. Uh, here are chicks at two weeks old. And you can see this Cornish cross is already starting to grow in feathers. Uh, you know, it's the size of a small melon or as the laying chick is still tiny, like the size of a, uh, a tennis ball. And if you go to the hardware store and you buy chicks and you have absolutely no idea what kind of chicks you got once you get home, uh, you can tell by how quickly they grow whether you got a meat chicken or a laying hen or, or a laying chick. If you buy straight runs, you, you don't know if they're, they're male or female. And what do we feed these chicks? Uh, the best thing to do is go to the feed store and ask for a 20% chick starter in crumble form. Uh, now, most of the time, these are gonna be labeled as starter and grower because they're formulated to meet all the animal's needs for energy, protein, vitamins, and minerals. It's very important. It is specifically calculated to meet all their nutritional demands. They're often labeled by protein percentages. You can buy 16% chick starter and crumble, uh, and, and they'll live and, and do fine on that, but their feathers don't grow in as well. And that extra protein really gives those feathers a boost. So if you've got pretty chickens, I strongly recommend that you feed a 20% crude protein feed uh, because that'll make their, their feathers grow in fuller, thicker, and sooner, and they will be prettier. They'll have a shiny coat to them and not a dull coat. Uh, and, they, and they just, they'll, they'll grow better with that extra bit of protein. The, the reason it's called crude protein and not just regular protein is because uh, we're not actually measuring the amount of protein in the feed. They're actually, they take a sample of the feed and they burn it at really high temperatures in like an ashing oven and then they measure the nitrogen and they multiply nitrogen times 6.25. And so other things contain nitrogen, amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins and non-protein sources and things. So that's why it's a crude measurement. It does not tell you everything that's in the feed. It just gives you a general idea of how much uh, protein is in that feed. So if you go to the feed store and you say, hey, I would like a bag of 20% chick starter. And the feed store says, we are out of 20% chick starter, but I have 20% laying hen feed. That's the same thing because the protein's the same. No, it is not. I can't tell you how many times I've gone to the feed store and the, the folks working at the feed store have told me that. Laying hens have different nutritional needs for vitamins, minerals, and energy than chicks do. And so it's not the same feed. Okay, just, I just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, the next thing that you'll see is you'll have a choice to buy either medicated or non-medicated feed. Uh, when feed is medicated, it contains a coccidia stat that prevents coccidiosis. Uh, coccidiosis is the most common cause of death in chicks, okay? Uh, if you have your chicks vaccinated with a coccidia stat, so I know when I, I order my chicks in from, from the hatchery, I have them vaccinated from the hatchery. And then that way I don't have to feed them a medicated feed because they already have received a coccidia stat. Now, if you feed a medicated feed to a chick that was vaccinated with a coccidia stat, it will cancel out the vaccine and the medication uh, and it won't work for I, and it just won't work. 
So don't double dip on that medication. I see a lot of folks, they want to buy organic feed. I understand your concerns, but I've also seen a lot of chicks die from coccidiosis when they're not given medicated feed. How do you know if you've got coccidiosis in chicks? Uh, you'll see them standing up, kind of hunched over. If they've got feathers, their feathers will be ruffled up. Their combs will uh, appear pale. They won't eat and drink as much as they normally do. Uh, they are inactive, so they, they're not moving around like lively chicks do. And they'll be off by themselves. So anytime you see chickens and they're off by themselves, you can probably suspect something is wrong. And just like kids or people, you know, just look at the general demeanor of your chickens. If, if, if their head's up and they're happy, they're probably not sick. But if they're standing over there hunched and look depressed, there's probably something wrong with them. And essentially what happens is either an infected bird, and it doesn't have to be another chicken. It could be uh, wild birds or, or, or other things carry coccidia. They deposit the uh, coccidia eggs onto the ground. The chicks come around. They pick up that coccidia. Once that egg hits their digestive tract, it basically wakes it up. And then the, uh, the coccidia starts digesting uh, parts of the internal anatomy of the chicken, and that's how they die. Uh, if the chicks are really young, you might not have a chance to see these symptoms because it will kill them so quickly. Uh, if you do catch it, it's a multifaceted approach to get them healthy. They need an anti-coccidial agent. I need an antibiotic and they need extra care. So it's better to keep those separate from the other chicks so the other chicks don't pick on them. And we wanna make sure that they, they get plenty of water and that they're comfortable. Now that we, we've talked about the, the horrible stuff like fire damage and, and coccidia, we can get onto the more of the lighthearted and fun stuff and, and that's easier to, to work with. Feeding and watering our chicks. So these chicks need to have uh, free access to feed and water while they're growing up. Uh, and if you can go to the feed store or what have you, just about anything works for a feeder for chicks. Uh, I like to use ones that have smaller openings because they also like to play in their feed. Uh, so when they're, they're really young, these plastic or metal containers work very well. Uh, my favorite thing to feed small chicks with are these mason jar style red plastic feeders. This one happens to have a plastic bottle instead of a mason jar, that's fine. You can buy these in metal too, but I don't like these galvanized feeders as much as I do the plastic ones. These galvanized feeders don't have 100% threads on them like the plastic ones do. They just have like four tabs and it's very easy to get those uh, bottles cross threaded on these and, and the bottom fall out and all the feed spills out. Uh, so I, I much prefer these plastic ones. Uh, when it comes to chick waterers, uh, the first couple days I have them in a chick brooder, I'll use one of these, I'll use one of these uh, mason jar style type waterers or a bigger waterer or if I have a large brooder set up. Uh, these are gravity fed waters. And, and when they come in the mail or I bring them home from the hardware store, when I pull them out of the box, I dip their beak into the waterer and then I put them into the brooder. If they've had a long, hard journey, I'll put some sugar in the water to give them an energy boost. And then a day or two later, I'll introduce what's called a nipple waterer. And, and the reason I really like nipple waterers is because they make a mess out of open water sources. They'll, they'll put feed in there, they'll poop in it, they put sawdust or straw in it. Uh, and they make a mess and you're constantly cleaning them out throughout the day to make sure that they have good access to fresh, clean water. Some folks are hesitant to use these nipple waterers because they don't think the chicks will know how to use them. Uh, instinctively, they're going to peck at it just to see what the heck it is. And as soon as they get a taste of that water, they'll, they'll start drinking from these. Uh, as soon as I see them start pecking those nipple waterers, I remove the other water and I only use nipple waterers to water them for the rest of their adult life and brooding life. Uh, they just don't make a mess like these kind of waterers do. Nipple waterers need to be hung so that the nipples are head high. So you can see these adult chickens here. You can see these adult chickens here right at head height and they're, and they're drinking from that. 
once the, the chicks get a little older, I hang the feeder too. And that keeps anything from getting under the bottom and getting nasty and gross. We had a question on whether ducks will drink from the nipple waterer. Oh, that's an excellent question. Ducks will drink from a nipple waterer. And, and when, I, when I brew ducks, I like to give them a nipple waterer so that they always have water that they can drink. Now, the problem with that, though, is ducks need to be able to dunk their face in water to clean out their nostrils and clean out their eyeballs. Uh, so you also have to give them an open water source. So if you put a bowl of water or one of these gravity feed waterers in a duck pen, they're going to go dunk their face in the water and they're going to be happy and they're going to play in the water and they are going to spill out the entire container of water into the brooder and just make a gigantic mess. And you can't leave it there because then it's a wet, damp environment and they can get cold and sick and die. So you're constantly cleaning the duck brooder. Now, folks that, that raise ducks commercially in brooders, they have specific setups where the ducks can walk out over the water, make as much mess as they want, and it drains into a drain and, 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 and blows out. Now, at, at your own house, you can't do that because it's way too complicated of a setup. So you either set up sacrificial stations for them to get, to get nasty and let them dunk their face in, in water, or probably the best option is only get ducklings when it's warm outside. And then you brood the ducks outside in the warm weather on grass and you move the brooder every day so they can make as much of a mess as they want. I, in, in my opinion, that's probably the best option to brooding ducks. Brooding them inside like chicks is a nightmare. You have to clean out the brooder at least once or twice a day. Also, when I brood ducklings, I take them over to the sink or the bathtub. So yeah, ducks are a mess. And, and I think as a backyard duck producer, the best thing to do is wait till it's really warm outside and then brood them outside in the pen where they're on grass. Chicken breeds. There are over 150 different kinds of chicken, 340 different color combinations. We can't talk about everybody's favorite chickens today but we will definitely talk about some. The first thing you have to ask yourself, and we talked about this earlier, is, is why do you want to keep the chickens? And then choose the chicken that is fitted to your needs and environment. So here in Maine, it gets very cold. So we want to choose chickens that are cold weather tolerant. And cold weather tolerant chickens usually have thick down coats, and they don't have large combs and wattles that can get frostbit. I think the best source that I've seen so far on uh, cold and heat stress tolerant chickens is the Moyers Murray McMurray Hatchery Catalog or website. You can actually get on there, look up the breed, and it will tell you whether that breed is cold tolerant, heat tolerant, yada, 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 and give you production characteristics. Uh, if you're new to chickens, start small. Uh, most of the times you have to buy a minimum number of chickens here in Maine. I can't remember if it's four or six, but don't get more than you can handle. Most folks will actually buy chickens in the spring because that's when they're available in the art in the feed store. But also that's a good time to buy chicks because they're going to be in the brooder while the weather is still, you know, back and forth. And then by the time they're old enough to go out in the coop at summertime, and then they'll be able to stay warm throughout the summertime. And then it's going to gradually get cold and they're going to acclimate to that cold over time. And they're going to be just fine over the winter time, as long as we give them a good coop to stay warm. Uh, a lot of folks ask, you know, where's the best place to get chicks? Just about all chicks that are, at the, are going to be come from a commercial hatchery. And so you can order them directly from the hatchery through the mail, or you can get them at a local feed store. Or if you know a local farmer that raises chickens, or you can go get chicks directly from your local farm. Just picking up random chicks from friends and neighbors, you can have very questionable quality on those animals and questionable biosecurity. And when I say biosecurity, uh, you don't know what kind of diseases those chicks have been exposed to and what you may be bringing onto your own property. 
Two places not to buy chickens is either a livestock auction or the farmer's market or along the side of the road. These kind of places congregate a whole bunch of different producers into one spot. And so that you have diseases from farm A, farm B, farm C, farm D, plus consumer A, consumer B, consumer, all converging into one location. So I think we all understand how this works, you know, because this is, this is how they explain COVID to us, you know, the coronavirus, you know, we know social distancing and, and not gathering in large groups. Well, this is what the chickens are doing at a farmer's market or a livestock auction. Uh, and they're more likely to get disease. Now, if you don't want to raise chicks and you're just ready to get started with eggs, you can actually find pullet producers, and that's a young female chicken uh, that's about ready to lay eggs. So you don't have to wait, you know, 20 months or 20 weeks for her to start laying eggs. So just be ready to lay eggs shortly. And you can also go to commercial operations. Uh, and buy spent hens. So most commercial operations will only keep hens for one or two seasons and then they get rid of them because they're, as their life goes on, they lay less and less eggs. So they want to keep production high and cost low. So they only use those chickens for one or two cycles. Folks are, uh, are often worried about ordering chicks through the mail. You know, is it safe to order chicks from the mail? Is it, does it hurt them? let's discuss the reasons why it's okay to order chicks by mail. Right before the chicks hatch, they absorb nutrients from the yolk of the egg. And those chicks live off those nutrients for two days. Okay, so they have two days of built in food and water. Uh, so when they hatch at the hatchery on day one, the hatchery will overnight them to you so that they still have these 48 hour nutrients in them, okay? And that's why it's okay to ship chicks in the mail. If it wasn't for that, it would be a terrible idea. Or the hatchery will let you know when they're about to ship them and when you can expect them to arrive so you can get your brooder all ready to go. Uh, and as soon as the chicks get to you, the post office is gonna call you. You're gonna drive down to the post office, you're gonna pick them up and you're gonna put them into the brooder as soon as you get home. Like I said, I like to dip their beaks in the water so that they know where the waterer is. And they, they'll they usually drink quite a bit so that they can get good and hydrated. Uh, a lot of times, uh, you know, being here in Maine, they, those chicks have to travel a long ways. It's not a bad idea to buy the electrolyte packages or put sugar in their water from the, uh, from the hatchery just to give them an extra boost and then throughout their life, they need free access to water. Uh, when they're younger, they need free access to food. And as they get older, you can limit their food intake. But always make sure they have good food and water. What makes a good chicken? One, we're going to look at their body conformation. Uh, so let's look down here at this chicken diagram. You can see that the, the main body part of the chicken is almost a rectangular shape. They have a deep, broad chest, a flat back, and a long keel bone. So from here to here. Uh, their comb, and that's the mohawk on top, and their wattles, which is the flappy skin bits on the bottom, are brightly colored and look healthy. And then we're gonna go down to their legs and make sure their, their legs are straight, evenly balanced. Uh, the scales don't look gross that they'll have a shiny waxy appearance when they're healthy. Now, if they're all crusted over and nasty looking, that could mean that they have mites or injuries or, or something else that's going on. And make sure that they're, they're walking well, that they're not laying. Eyeballs should be large, bright, clear, and prominent, and they will be very alert to you. So if, if you move your hands, you might see them jump or move or, or something. Always make sure that those chickens are good and alert if you can walk around the chickens, especially if you can walk around one side of the chickens and they're not moving or acting like they see that you're there, they may have some blindness issues in that eye. Whenever chickens are healthy and well-fed, their feathers will look bright 
and vibrant and clean. Now, if they are have been in a stressful situation, you can see broken, missing, or discolored feathers, but they should always have just a very clean and tidy appearance to them, like they just got out of the bathtub, you know, just, just ready to go. This is a fun topic because there's a lot of myths and misconceptions about the egg color. The first is what color eggs will my chickens lay? And essentially, we've got three different options here. We got white eggs, we got brown eggs, and we got like the Easter egg chicken eggs, which could be blue, green, kind of pinkish tinted colors. Red lobe, so if we look at their earlobes here, right? Right here, red lobed chickens tend to lay brown eggs and white lobed chickens tend to lay white eggs. Now, what's the difference between white and brown eggs? This is strictly a personal preference on, on, on your part. There is no nutritional difference between a white and a brown egg. In fact, a brown egg is just a white egg that has brown pigment on it. You can actually scratch the brown off of an egg if you wanted to. And, and shell quality really doesn't differ by breed. So, so one chicken is going to have just the heart of egg as another chicken. Uh, brown eggs aren't tougher than white eggs. Brown eggs don't come from farm chickens of compared to commercial chickens. I, I've heard a lot. And, you know, over the years, some unscrupulous uh, commercial farms marketed brown eggs as like, uh, free range or, or, or farm raised chickens compared to commercial eggs, which were all white. And, and that's simply not true. It's just the, the breed of chicken laying the eggs. When it comes to uh, genetics, though, the white egg laying hens are the most cost efficient. So they eat the less, a lesser amount of feed to produce the same amount of eggs. The most common egg laying chickens in the US, so most of our commercial production, are gonna be the leghorn chickens. Uh, and, and these hens are gonna weigh about four, four and a half pounds, and they produce over 300 eggs a year. Compared to the most common brown egg laying chickens, the red sex link chickens, uh, and these are a cross of a, of a Rhode Island red and a Rhode Island white. These are pretty important chickens because they are cold hardy and very reliable egg layers throughout the year. So they don't stress out as much, but they don't produce as many eggs per year. Uh, now as a backyard person, I don't want everyone to get caught up in egg production numbers because these chickens are gonna produce more eggs than you know what to do with. Uh, you're going to end up trying to give them away to your neighbors and your neighbors are going to be happy at first. Your neighbors won't even want your eggs. You're gonna, your eggs are just going to start piling up. So keep in mind, chickens will lay, when they're laying, will lay one egg every 25 hours. They basically lay one egg a day. And if you've got six chickens, you can expect six eggs a day. That's a dozen every two days. Most people don't go through a dozen eggs every two days. So the, the eggs will pile up. Now there's also a group of chickens that lay a different color egg. And these are what we commonly refer to as Easter eggers. Uh, the Americanas or the Aracana chickens. Uh, really unique looking chickens. They are very popular and very common for the backyard producers. Uh, they have red earlobes with ear tufts or muffs and beards. So look around the face and you can see they kind of got a bearded or old school mustachey look here. The, the neat thing about these chickens are their ability. They, they don't mind being around people as much. They're, they're much calmer. They don't scatter as much as the other type of chicken. And they still lay a lot of eggs, you know, 250 eggs a year. That's a lot of eggs. This is a, a fun chart because this is, these are the characteristics that we're looking for to make sure that our chickens are still laying eggs, you know. Once they get older, they, they'll stop laying eggs and, and, you know, are those chickens just preloading or are they actively laying eggs? So the first thing we want to look at is the comb and the wattles, their mohawk and, and dangly bits. If they're laying, they have large, bright red, glossy combs and wattles. If they're sick or too old or, or something's stressing them out too much, they're going to look smaller and shriveled up in a duller color. Okay. 
we look at their beak, laying hens usually have a more bleached look to their beak compared to a bright yellow tinted beak. Their pubic bones are flexible and wide, whereas a non-laying one will be stiff and close together. The back side of the chicken will be large, moist, and bleached looking compared to a small, dry, puckered vent. And the feet will be the very similar to the beak on the laying versus non-laying hen. Now, before we start chicken nutrition, I'm gonna take a break here so that folks can ask questions. Okay, someone was just asking how much space uh, uh, chickens need for an outdoor run. We, I've been responding to some questions about, uh, you know, when it's time to uh, free range them and I suggested free ranging uh, wasn't what we were uh, we would recommend, but the, to put them in a pen outside or to use chicken, chicken tractors. Uh, and I had uh, responded three and a half to four and a half uh, uh, square feet of floor space per mature laying bird. Uh, and we're going to go over how much square footage they need in different type of coop and outside situations later on. Okay, the and there were several questions on when to switch over from medicated feed to non-medicated. And I uh, included our fact sheet on poultry nutrition. Uh, and it depends if they can go from uh, uh, the starter to grower to developer to layer, or uh, they may need, they may uh, skip one of those uh, feeds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great resource for that uh, question. And let's see, can we talk about the preferred method to keep their water from freezing in the winter? Yes, we have a whole section on that. All right, and uh, someone's commented, uh, I feed mine uh, oatmeal all winter and gut eggs all winter. Uh, not as many, but now, not as many as now, but still. My pullets even stayed laying in January. And we're going to talk a little bit about yeah. getting eggs in wintertime too. So. They're wondering what your favorite chicken care book is, especially health issues and that may come up. I think the best chicken book out there is the Stories Guide to Raising Chickens. And we have that for sale in our uh, publications catalog. I'll try to put a link to that in the chat. I've got it right here in my bookshelf. <laughs> There it is. I'll put a link in the chat. Um, there were some folks that were having some uh, disease symptoms and uh, one person had uh, a death of 10 out of 50 chicks that they got. And I said, had suggested that they send uh, them in for a necropsy uh, and in included the link there. Uh, but maybe you want to talk Remind them again, uh, things to do to prevent the early chick death. That is to keep a clean, dry brooder at the appropriate temperature, have free access to food and water, and feed a medicated feed to prevent coccidiosis. Because coccidiosis is a, is a prevalent problem, and like I said, it's the number one cause of chick death. Let's stop here and then we'll continue part two after the break.